Good morning. Um, my name is Harry Powell. I am director of uh, data and analytics at Jaguar Land Rover. And uh, I'm presenting to you uh, uh, from uh, from Oxford in uh, in England. Um, and uh, it's great to be with you uh, today. It's sad not to be in Lisbon like last time, but uh, it's uh, it's great to be back uh, with you guys. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you a little story uh, about uh, it's kind of a familiar one uh, about uh, COVID uh, and how uh, in my industry an industry really really based around forecasting and how really where forecasting is really really important uh, how COVID completely turned that on its head and uh, um, and as a result we've had to not only change our approach but change our technology um, and how we uh, as an analytics team uh, drove that change in the business, a change which was probably existential for us uh, and allowed us to survive um, in reasonable health uh, in a way that perhaps if the business had had their way and, and wanted to stick with the idea of forecasting, we might not have managed. So uh, it's a kind of a story of topsy-turvy COVID land um, and at the same time um, how an analytics team can really uh, drive a, a, a massive change to a business uh, at a time of crisis. So I work for Jaguar Land Rover. We're a car company, an automotive manufacturer in the kind of long-winded American uh, terms. Uh, we make cars, right? And uh, I hope you know some of our brands. We do sell them in Portugal. Uh, we sell Jaguars. Uh, I know that Fernando had a Jaguar at one time. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, Land Rovers and Range Rovers, I guess, are perhaps our, our biggest and most well-known brand. So they're kind of premium. Uh, premium uh, cars, perhaps like a BMW or a Mercedes, that kind of thing. A lot of four by fours SUVs. Now, the uh, automotive uh, sector is around, is is, is is manufacturing, and it's all around scale. Uh, and uh, you can think of the manufacture of a car as a bundle of parts that you assemble together, uh, and you need all of those parts in order to assemble one car. And those parts come from lots and lots of different places. But in order to make any one of those parts, you uh, you have to have tooling, which is a special machine to make that part. You have to design it. There's big fixed cost and timelines in 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 uh, creating capacity to 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 build the parts that go into a car. And as a result, uh, supply is really fixed. It, it's fixed physically um, because all your suppliers have got uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturing supply chains of their own, but it's also fixed contractually. Uh, you agree to buy a certain number of parts over certain periods of time, and as a result, that that supplier can decide how big their their facility is in order to manufacture the parts, whether it's a wheel or or uh, uh, an engine or, or a windscreen or a, uh, a uh, electrical harness or whatever it is. Um, your supply is really fixed, right? Um, both contractually and and physically. However, this is a company that this is a sector where which has variable demand, right? Uh, different times of year, uh, you get uh, different demand for different kinds of products. Um, in the UK, people buy uh, buy cars often in March and September when the when the number plate uh, regulation changes. Um, different times in in you know in China, I think they buy around New Year time. But more more than that, certain cars become fashionable at different times. So. Um, you and, and options, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this kind of goes up and down an enormous amount. Um, you know this, and and so 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 the, the challenge, the whole challenge of the automotive sector in terms of manufacturers, how do you match fixed supply to variable demand? Right, that is the challenge. Right, that's everything, and it's made really hard by the heterogeneity of cars. Right, so um, lots of different kinds of car, uh, different vehicle lines different uh, uh, different uh, trim levels you know is it the one with kind of leather seats or the one with 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 uh, cloth seats you know high or low trim um, a whole load of different options really really uh, and, and and all sold in different markets they have to be set in diff uh, you, you you can only sell certain kinds of cars in certain markets due to local regulations it's a really heterogeneous sector um, each car is really complicated. So um, 
you know, to, to assemble a Range Rover, you choose from about 30,000 different parts, four and a half to 5,000 parts in any car. That's a pretty complex um, uh, operation, right? And, and, and while obviously uh, the, the say, say an aircraft is a more complex uh, manufactured good, um, you don't build them at the scale and with the margins that you build a car at. Right. So, you know, you've got that very difficult, com complex combination of a really complex car, um, uh, uh, you know, with, without huge margins. Uh, yeah, I, I think the sector is about six percent. We're below that. Um, in order to to meet those margins, you have just in time um, delivery. Uh, right. So you have uh, your suppliers deliver only the parts you need when you need it in order to minimize uh, inventory. Uh, again, that that puts more of a. Uh, a constraint around fixed supply. You don't have huge amounts of inventory to, to smooth that out. At the same time, from the demand point of view, uh, you have uh, it's kind of hard to, to match variable demand when sometimes it can take um, many months to get a car from an order to a market. You know, if you're shipping uh, cars out to China, you're not going to be flying two and a half tons of Range Rover to China. Um, so it takes time in the boat. It takes time at the dock. It takes time getting from the dock to the to the to, to the retailer, um, and it may sit on the lot for a while after that. So there's a there's a real time lapse between when you want decide you want to build a car and when you're actually able to to sell it. Um, and of course, um, you uh, you know you're doing that globally. There's this kind of global supply chain. So you're affected by all sorts of things like customs. Um, uh, and, uh, and 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 local local effects that you don't kind of know about, and of course, COVID is we're going to come on to is is going to be a key one in that. And what's more, um, inventory builds up really quickly. We spend five hundred million pounds a week um, in uh, in Jaguar Land Rover, around about. Um, and uh, so, for every week of, of building a car but not being able to sell it, um, uh, you. Uh, uh, because, for example, you've predicted demand wrongly, uh, you're spending, you're putting 500 million pounds into inventory, sort of, right? So this is this is a tricky business, right? Really tricky, and it all comes down to fixed supply and variable demand. So historically, um, the uh, the automotive industry has tried to to, to 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 deal with this supply and demand problem by kind of fixing demand, right? And how we fix demand is through forecasts, right? So you'll all be uh, completely aware of this approach, but think of it as like fixing demand, right? If you think you can predict what people are going to buy, then you can behave as if that is written in stone, right? As if that is absolutely fixed. And if your forecast is good, then your supply will match your demand in the market. And, uh, uh, and and that really suits an industry that is has grown up historically around around the supply and the manufacture of cars rather than about the understanding of the customer. Right. Uh, that's just the mentality of, of the business. It's pretty hard to build the car. That's where we focus. So we've historically had forecasts um, uh, in order to help us fix demand. Now, historically, uh, uh, conventionally, uh, you know, your forecast is your budget. Right. And so what people did was they went into great detail, a very manual process could take a number of months, all sorts of negotiations about what kind of cars you were going to sell where. It was never able to be particularly detailed and it was highly political. Right. So um, different parts of the company would bash each other in order to change the budget, get the budget up or down. Um, when the budget didn't work out, there was all sorts of politics as to why and whose fault. Um, but fundamentally, the problem is it didn't tell you a lot of information. It didn't really help you uh, in any great detail uh, understand what your demand was going to be. Uh, and it was really slow. Right. So if there was any change in demand, you couldn't adjust to it because it took you two months to get the budget together in the first place. Now, all sorts of other approaches were taken to uh, uh, to forecasting. And I think from our point of view, the first big step up. Um, and it came from my team, actually, was uh, some kind of machine learning approach, um, uh, you know, nearest neighbors or random forests or some regression or whatever it is. Right. People try different things. Um, all pretty hopeless, by the way. Um, and uh, and largely that's because we have kind of 20 key markets, uh, 13 key, um, uh, th 13 uh, vehicle lines. 
Um, that's you know, vehicle types, nameplates, whatever. Um, all sorts of options within that. Once you start looking at the number of cars we sell, which let's call it half a million, half a million cars a year, it actually doesn't take long before uh, the number of cars in any one segment of that is quite small, right? And then you've got to look at that over months because we care about, it's not just how many cars we sell in a year, each month. Um, so take 20 times 13, um, what is that? That's uh, uh, 260 uh, times uh, 24 months. Well, uh, you know, very quickly we're, we're moving into an air, into a zone where uh, we, we simply don't actually have a huge number of, uh, um, of uh, data points in any one month to really understand. So um, we, we, although it's quick, machine learning hasn't been totally helpful. What's more, it tends to 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 uh, um, predict a single point, right? In China, Range Rovers, um, uh, Range Rovers high spec in March, we are going to sell twenty five cars, right? Whatever, right? It doesn't tell you how likely that is to happen. Uh, you know, whether it could be between twenty and thirty, it doesn't tell you that, generally speaking. OK, so we then moved on to a, a much more uh, complex, um, but a much more rich way of modeling called hierarchical Bayesian modeling. And in fact, we innovated a number of um, uh, approaches within this that have been uh, adopted by some of the uh, better known of the Internet giants, um, uh, which we're pretty pleased about. But but what does hierarchical mean? It means that somehow we managed to learn across the entire piece um, because in some sense, Everyone's buying a car, but some people are buying Jaguars and some people are buying Range Rovers. When we learn how people are buying Jaguars, that does actually tell us a little bit about how, we're, how people are buying Range Rovers, right? Because there is a market for cars as a whole. And when we then look within, say, Range Rover, Land Rovers, um, we have a big Range Rover and we have a medium Range Rover and we have a Velar, which is like a city version of a Range Rover. And we have a little Range Rover called Evoque. And of course, um, when we learn about how people are buying the little evokes um that doesn't tell us everything about how people are buying the big range rover but it does tell us a bit about people's view of range rover as a brand as a whole um and uh, so you can see how you can learn between different vehicle lines which if you just model them independently you can't do um it's also uh, so that makes it very efficient um secondly uh, it's uh um it allows us to predict uncertainty. It's a Bayesian technique. It's based on uh, Bayes rule, as you'll you'll all know. And um, that means that, that when we model it, we get a distribution. We have some prior uh, knowledge and we, we, we uh, are able to uh, get a distribution at the back end. So we're not just saying we'll sell 25 cars. We're saying, you know, there's a likelihood, um, a probability of, uh, of selling a bit more than that or a bit less than that. And again, that then allows us to understand how, how we might want to set our supply chain. Um, to, to, to deal with that. And then thirdly, you can take in ex expert opinion. Those of you who are aware of Bayesian techniques will know that uh, by uh, changing your prior, you can take expert opinion into account. So you can say, do you know what? Um, while history may have tell us that, that, that we're likely to get this kind of distribution, we know that there's been some something that's happened in, uh, in a market or we know we've just refreshed the model or whatever it is. And we can then um, tamper, we can adjust the model uh, in order for uh, for us to get a better result. And you know what? That was pretty good. That's a pretty good model. It's pretty amazing how it works. Um, and it gives us a very rich output. Uh, and, but, and most importantly, it's really fast. So whereas before it would take about 25 days to change a budget um, and, and still quite a long time to change the machine learning version of that. Um, so that if you had new information in a month, it would take you most of the month to change change your forecast and only a few month, few days at the end of it to work out what to do. Um, the hierarchical Bayesian model can get you very rich information um, uh, within hours of the new uh, sales uh, results coming in. Um, in fact, it could, I guess, do it in real time. Um, and uh, the result of that is that uh, we uh, uh, we're able to be much more nimble uh, with uh, the um, uh, uh, given new information, we're able to change our uh, change our approach much quicker. So it's a pretty cool model, right? And it allows us to fix demand uh, in the way that we talked about. So along comes COVID-19 um, and uh, uh, you don't often build models to take into account a global pandemic, right? 
normally you think, well, if one country goes down, another country will go up, right? Um, that's not what happened here, and you're completely aware of that. Um, it stopped things, right? So generally, we're used to things going up and down by 5% or 10% or maybe even 15%, right? Um, uh, over a whole year, you know, and then other countries are going up a bit and, you know, we, we lose a bit of Range Rover volume, but we gain a bit of Jaguar volume, whatever it is. This is utterly unlike anything we've seen, right? We know this, right? This is, this is you've all experienced this. We've actually stopped things. We actually stopped factories, right? We suppliers stopped supplying. Retailers closed in different countries. And it was different by country. That's true. But generally across the world, it, it just all happened at once. Data stopped, right? For car sales, data stopped. And one of the things I asked myself at the beginning is like, OK, so it's quite easy to stop stuff. But how do you restart it? Right. How do you actually restart production? Um, uh, given that it takes time to get the cars out of the factory into the markets. Um, how do you restart production? Because you've got no idea what it's going to be like. And you're racking up inventory at 500 million pound a week if you started off full on. Right. But we're a, we're a company with fixed overheads. We can't afford just to sit and wait for the whole market to, to come back again. Right. Uh, for everything to be uh, um, to, to, to working as to be working as normal. That would just not be a viable option for us. And yet we can't just go back to normal because that wouldn't be a viable option either. And whereas normally the Bayesian model can give us a reasonably narrow uh, margin of error around how we might want to uh, um, build cars and the trim levels and the parts we need in order to do that with some degree of accuracy. Right. Um, uh, once COVID hit, just there was, you know, there was simply no point producing forecasts. We tried this. We tried that. The business was super keen. Tell us your forecast. What's going to happen? And the answer is we don't know. And it's not about how good the, the model is. We just don't know. And if we were going to give you a number that we were confident in, it would be so low. You just slap us on the face and tell us to go back and try harder. Right. We don't know. We can see on the right hand uh, graph that I've sketched out professionally here. Um, you know, the margin of error was nothing all the way back to no change back to normal. Right. The expectation was in the middle. But the, but but, you know, who could tell? Right. And if you get it wrong, you suddenly spent a whole load of cash that we couldn't afford to do. Now, this is a problem, right, because this is a business which at its heart, in its soul, cares about forecasts relies on those forecasts, believes in those forecasts. And yet suddenly we're telling them that everything that they were believing in had gone. Right. And all they could do was ask us for better forecasts. Try this. Try this. Try put more data in. Try. Fundamentally, guys, forecasts were not the right game in town. So what are we going to do instead? So when the world turns on its head and, uh, and nothing is the same, um, you, uh, um, you've got to sit and think a little bit. I think everyone rushed around a lot and we did a lot of thinking. Didn't take a huge amount of time. But when the world turns on its head, turn your thinking on its head too. If the world is completely different, think completely differently. We knew forecasts were rubbish. We knew we couldn't fix demand. So there's only one solution there. How do you make supply variable? Right. Or at least how do you kind of pretend that supply is variable? Well, your suppliers aren't suddenly variable and your man and your um, your uh, factories are not so suddenly variable. There is something that you can do that um, that is variable and that's information flow. Right. That's what we do. We are analysts and data scientists. We're good at information flow. So what do we do to to uh, to address this? Well, we said instead of trying to fix demand, try to just. Forget demand completely, right? Demand will be, well, so don't forget demand. Forget forecasting demand. Look for signals of demand and then work out how you can be responsive. What can you do? How can you make your supply chain responsive, right? And that's more to do with what you do than what your suppliers can do. So instead of saying, given a demand for a car, right? How can I supply it? Think, given a rough idea of demand for cars, right? And a knowledge of what your suppliers can supply. What is the combination of cars? What's the best, most profitable combination of cars that you can make given your demand and given your supply? And then make those. So don't make everything, 
right? Just make the stuff you can make given un difficult to understand demand. So you've got a, a set of things you can make and given fixed supply. How do you choose within that intersect? Now, this is hard, right? Because supply chains are, co chains are complex and they're not well behaved functions. We're not talking about an optimization here, at least not kind of a, some kind of uh, uh, linear programming, uh, continual variable thing, right? These are not well behaved functions. You have um, uh, supplier constraints, you have contractual uh, penalties, uh, minimum delivery amounts. Uh, all sorts of things. These are not these have all sorts of discontinuities in there. Right. And, and on top of that, it doesn't matter if you can optimize for um, certain parts. If you're missing one single part for making your car, you don't make that car. So how on earth are you going to do it? Because this is not a conventional optimization thing where you say, given the set of uh, set of cars I can make, given the set of cars I think I can sell, what is the optimal uh, uh, intercept between them? That's not how it's going to work. We're going to need to be a bit more entrepreneurial and we're going to need a technology to do that. OK, so um, I started that a bit, uh, bit, bit enthusiastically, right? But I'm enthusiastic about this slide. And, and, and um, you may have seen some other stuff on the Internet about some of the uh, talks I've been talking about graph. I've been interested in graph for a long time since I was in banking. Uh, these are graph databases. Don't get them confused with graph processing, like uh, some of the graph uh, processing frameworks on Spark, for example. These are databases that encode um, encode relationships. So you don't have joins. These are not SQL. Uh, um, you don't you don't do a kind of a conventional SQL join on them. You pre-join everything, um, and that allows very very free free flowing um, uh, relationship based. Uh, organization of information. Uh, the technology we've used is Tiger Graph, who I found absolutely brilliant. If you ever want a scalable graph, um, it's worth speaking to those guys. Um, uh, but the, 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 the I'm not here to represent them. Um, but what it allows you to do is represent your information in a very, very natural way. And I'm not going to go deeply into graphs here, but the answer was um, if you can represent your graph, your data in a graph, then you can start identifying pain points right, of, of, of things you can't supply. And you can start trying to see uh, what you might be able to do instead. Um, it allows you to browse through through and, 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 and trace through the uh, through the network to uh, um, to address this problem of how do you how do you find the next best thing within a very highly complex um, uh, set of information? Um, we were able to think about what the suppliers were had the biggest risk, not just because of them themselves, but because of the way, for example, that they get the uh, the parts to us, um, how what who they're reliant on, um, uh, how many what kind of cars we build are reliant on those suppliers. So if the supplier supplies something that we hardly ever use or on a car that makes no profit, we're not so bothered. But if they're the core component in a really profitable car, we really care about them. All these kind of questions are not easily answered uh, in uh, relational databases. Um, we were able to think of alternative production plans. So um, we found out that uh, uh, a whole load of tow bars uh, arrived at our factory in Slovakia that were broken, right? Uh, this isn't a specifically a COVID problem, but um, in the past, it would have been really, really hard to work out what to do next. And we might just have kind of waited for those those uh, um, tow bars to be fixed. But now with the graph, uh, we were able to be much more responsive um, to a change in, well, in fact, in that case, a change in supply, but a change in demand would just be able to be responsive. We were saying, OK, so if we can't build the cars that had the tow bar, Let's have a look through our order bank and match up the, the specifications or the part specifications of a whole load of cars that are almost identical, but don't include the tow bar. What, how many of those can we make? How many can we move up the uh, how, how many can we move up the queue so we keep our factory going? Um, and of course, you can't necessarily make all of them exactly the same. Maybe. Um, so we had a problem with ambient lighting. Uh, the factory that made it in, in Serbia, uh, made the ambient lighting, uh, had um, had to close down 50 percent of production because of COVID. Right. And the other 50 percent was not effective. We suddenly couldn't get ambient lighting for our cars. OK, so obviously we can't build those cars. 
Um, but what kind of things, how can we look at the kind of parts that we can get hold of uh, and on the kind of specifications of the cars we've seen, how can we find a nearest, uh, um, how can we find a nearest equivalent? And then how can we see if we can produce that? Uh, uh, can we go back to the uh, customer and uh, and off make them an offer and say, well, look, we can't give you ambient lighting. We can give you something else, better a better stereo or something. And here's a deal on that. How can we keep our factories going? Given a change in 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 our circumstances, how can we be super flexible and super responsive? And you know what? We haven't tried to automate this. This hasn't been about how can you make some optimization algorithm which changes everything. What we've done is we've given the, a tool, a completely new tool that's nothing to do with forecasting to a business to to give them other options, other ways of doing things. And of course, that's been really hard because the business is set up to think about forecasting, set up to think about fixed uh, fixed supply. And we're saying, no, think differently. This is a crisis. Think differently. Here is a completely new tool that allows you to be responsive and flexible in uh, uh, in in this crisis. So I think I've run out of time, right? Um, uh, for which uh, I apologise. Um, but this is my message, right? When the world is turned upside down, think differently, right? As as data scientists and analysts, we're not just about trying to optimise something or get the best accuracy out of something or build the most complicated algorithm for something. If everything's tumbling, tumbling upside down, tumble your brain upside down. Think of things in a completely different way. Don't just try and improve the forecast you had before. Say, forget that. There's a new game in town. We'll move on. We'll do something differently. And you'll actually, it's a much more exciting place to be. Um, this is, as I as say, a story of how we replaced uh, big Bayesian hierarchical Bayesian networks for long, long and medium term forecasting um, with a graph database that allowed us to browse supply chains, right? Who'd have thought that those two got us to the same answer, which is how do you match supply and demand uh, in a uh, notoriously complex, um, in a notoriously complex business in a crisis. So look, happy Christmas. Thank you for joining me in this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Maybe next time I can be back in Lisbon or, or wherever the next time uh, uh, the conference is. Um, but happy Christmas, uh, stay safe. And uh, I hope uh, you've uh, enjoyed something of this presentation.